to this webinar is culture and sorry. Sorry, I just started the recording now, so. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Oh, sorry, okay, let's start new again then. Okay, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. This is our first WCAA webinar on the coronavirus. The title is Co Culture and Public Health in the Era of Coronavirus. Uh, the first thing I'm going to ask to everyone that is attending is please turn off your micros and turn off your videos so that we can see on our screens only the seven speakers, otherwise it gets too confusing. If we only have the faces of the people who are actually doing the talking, it makes things easier. And then after everybody has spoken, then we will turn to the questions by the audience and you will be able to use your chat space on the right side of your screen to pose the questions. Two things I want to explain beforehand. First of all, this is a WCAA, World Council of Anthropological Associations webinar. It's our very first webinar online. Uh, so since we are a worldwide organization, we would love to include all the possible languages in the world. Unfortunately, that is not possible because we need to communicate amongst each other. So we are going to use English here but I want to let you know that later on, when the questions come uh, and the discussion comes, the, the open discussion comes, if you wish to write some questions and you, you, you don't feel comfortable using English, please do so in your languages on the right side. This will be recorded, both the audio and the chat, so we can later on uh, share it through the worldwide organizations, the different anthropological associations. The second thing I want to explain is that um, the WCAA, the World Council of Anthropological Associations, is an association of associations. So we welcome and have as partners, as members, uh, associations of anthropology from all over the world. Uh, WCAA is also a partner with IUAES, uh, which is the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences, and together, WCAA and IUAS form now the WOW, which is the World Anthropological Union. You can get into our websites where you will have more info about what these organizations do. As far as this webinar is concerned, as I said, we will be recording it. It will be later on available on the websites of, of both WOW and WCAA. So having said this, I want to, of course, thank everyone, all the colleagues that I contacted and that so, uh, you know, accepted our invitation and are here today with us. Um, and I also want to explain that this was an idea we had in our last um, WCA board meeting, which was just two weeks ago. And we are fully aware that there are anthropologists all over the world working on medical anthropology and on pandemics, but it would be impossible to have everyone in one webinar. So we probably will do follow-ups from this one. And to start with, we contacted some of our colleagues, uh, which I will be presenting now. I, I ask everyone to please, please keep your micros and videos on mute and, and videos off. Otherwise, we start listening to everyone. That's not good. So. Hi. Hi I'm from Russia. Hi, Thank how you. are you? Could, could you just all please turn Thank your you. micros off and videos off? Thank you. So what we'll do is we'll have um, a first round of... Um, of okay. Thank you. Can you turn the, the micro off, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, we will have everyone talk for four minutes the most. Please, please keep it short. And after the after we have the first round, we will have a second round where all the colleagues that are presenting can react to each other's opinions, comments, etc. And that will be followed by a half an hour of uh, open, wide discussion. So I will be flagging a white paper saying one minute once you reach the three, four minutes so that you keep track of your time. And I will be very briefly introducing our speakers today. 
since we had to start some way, I decided to start from east to west. And so, first of all, we will have our colleague from um, China, Jing Guang, from the University of Shanghai, well, NYU Shanghai, actually. Uh, and then we will have, we'll move uh, towards the east, and we will have afterwards um, from France, Frederick, Frederick Keck, if he comes in. I don't see him in, I don't know what happened here. But then we will have our colleague from Italy, Roberta Raffaetta, from the University of Bolzano. And I apologize because what happened was uh, in the beginning, we did not have our colleagues from Italy. Uh, then we saw that there was space to have one more. And of course, Italy is a crucial country at this point since uh, the pandemic crisis is, uh, as you all know, very bad there. So um, Roberta accepted to come in uh, very late. So I apologize for that. It was, everything was very much done in a very short, uh, organized in a very short period of time. So after Roberta Raffaetta, we will have um, Isaac Niamongo from the Cooperative University of Kenya, our colleague in the WCA organizing committee. Then from Portugal, University of Lisbon, we will have uh, Cristiana Bastos. From Brazil, we will have Sergio Carrara from the University of the State of Rio de Janeiro. And finally, last but not least, our colleague Charles Briggs from University of California, Berkeley. I am not going to read uh, you know, their bio notes. We posted online the bio notes of all these colleagues. They are all, of course, specialists on medical anthropology. They are all, they're all been working with different pandemics from AIDS to Xinguaya to other um, epidemics uh, all over the world. And so uh, just to keep it short, I, I think I will start, we will start with the, with the well, the presentations and, and the discussion. And, um, you know, we apologize in already for any technological problems people might have, but as I said, this is an experiment. Uh, we're doing this for the first time and it's a worldwide thing. So, like I said, we have people where it's almost 10 p.m. and others where it's 6 a.m. So, uh, please bear with me and bear with everyone. And once again, thank you very, very much to all the colleagues for participating on this. And thank you, a very special thanks to the University of Northern British Columbia and to our colleague, Michelle Bouchard, who was the, who is the host. So who through their Zoom and uh, their uh, technological systems made this webinar possible. So once again, please turn your videos off, Rita, and turn your micros off. And we will start with Jing. Hey, can you hear me? Cool. Um, yes. First of all, cool. Okay, so I'll start there. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for virtually connecting us during the time of physical social distancing. And I don't want to waste time here, so I want to share two major points based on the questions and themes the organizers sent us. First, I want to argue that a mixed methodology in ethnography is really critical to help us understand the structural violence during the COVID-19. By mixed, I mean two things. First is to make the best use of the tools that are available to us as anthropologists. Second is to collaborate with others in the process of knowledge production. So let me quickly share with you my experience during the COVID-19. Uh, my friend Lili, who is now in Germany, and I collaborated on a Sinophobia Tracker project. We find that there are many digital tools already available for conducting digital ethnography, uh, as many of you know, for example, the Google Sites and the Zoom and Skype that we are using now. We also use qualitative data analysis software such as NVivo to help us identify the shifting trends and themes that we collected through the way. Um, I previously intend to share with you one chart that we uh, make, but due to some technological problem, I won't be able to do it. So if you're interested, you can send me an email later. Our next step 
in terms of collaboration is actually to work a social psychologist colleague to explore the impact of COVID-19 on racially diverse students. And the second step is to develop a student-oriented program to discuss the social and political impact of COVID-19. So um, here are what we do, but I want to point out that structural violence during COVID-19 is actually much more complex. For, ex for example, the Hispanics and Blacks in the U.S. actually suffer the most from the neoliberal predatory healthcare system. And another Sorry. We can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I don't see that. So another example, unfortunately, is happening in China now. As many of you know, that Africans in Guangzhou are suffering from the discriminatory, discriminatory treatment from the Chinese government. And also, we notice that many women are suffering from the increasing load of housework and domestic violence during the COVID-19. So how to understand them, how to make interventions in terms of policy suggestion or analysis, I argue that we need to be more inventive with our ethnographic toolkits as well as expressions. And this brings me to my second point. I want to advocate for a timely anthropology of action. It is often believed that um, anthropology is an untimely business, yet I believe anthropologists are always sensitive, creative, and timely in our response to social events and the disasters such as the global pandemic. For instance, in in the Sinophone world, um, rather than China, I would say, my anthropology friends are doing things such as organizing webinars and reading clubs, writing about zoonosis and presenting them in major media outlets, advocating for legal protection of wild and domesticated animals, helping organizing the donation to the front frontline health care workers, and also translating stuff written by other anthropologists, fellows, and social activists. So I'll end, um, I want to end with a um, comment written by the Wuhan-based author named Fang Fang. Her diary just came out. She said that in a disaster, time cannot be quiet and beautiful. Time only witnesses the bravery of survivors who strive to live while facing death. I hope that together we can endure this quiet and quiet time we are all in as anthropologists and as human beings. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jing. So we just heard our colleague Jing Wang from New York University, Shanghai. So she's uh, in the middle of a country where things have not been easy at all. And the following person that would talk uh, if we follow the East to West uh, guideline that I said is our colleague Karin Asgard Janssen from the University of Bergen. And uh, I've been in contact with Karin for the past two weeks and she explained me straight away that she's ill with the uh, with Corona and then so she was not sure whether she would be able to participate or not depending on her health uh, status but this morning she wrote me saying she was feeling bad so she really felt sorry but she couldn't be in with us but I hope she's listening to us and she sent me just a, a very brief paragraph um, that she asked me to read which I will do now and once again, thanking her for her availability and hoping she gets better really soon. Um, now, online, we had sent the themes and the questions that we had shared with all the participants. Uh, I did not read them now, but I, I can do it now so that you understand why Karin uh, wrote what she wrote. Basically, the themes we had selected were the themes of the mobilization of anthropologists, what is expected from anthropologists in times of crisis, pandemics, and the second one, the idea of how can ethnography and anthropology critically contribute to prepare for crisis, to translate to different cultural views, the dominant discourses on pandemics, 
and to analyze and prepare for their social and political repercussions. These questions were actually set up for our previous um, Portuguese Anthropological Association and Brazilian Association webinar we had last week, and they were put together by our colleague Monica Saavedra, whom I thank. In the meanwhile, and having discussed this with other colleagues, our colleague Christiana Bastos added some more specific questions to this that I also sent to the participants, basically following the two themes, the specific questions are how are you as an anthropologist or how were you as an anthropologist expecting something like this? What are the instruments that anthropology and the social sciences gave you to make sense of this epidemic and share for you to contribute to public policies for rapid intervention? And how do you foresee the work in anthropology in the near future as a consequence of the pandemia? So these were basically the themes and sub-themes we had selected. What uh, Karin Janssen wrote is the following, uh, and she wants to share it with you all. She wrote, along with so many others, this situation has been a physical, mental, and financial roller coaster ride. I was supposed to briefly pass by Sweden on my way home to Norway after two weeks as a guest researcher at the Austrian Academy of Sciences in Vienna. And five weeks later, I am still here. <laughs> I was first placed in quarantine and then in isolation due to relatively mild but recurring symptoms. In the meanwhile, Norway closed its borders. So similar to other scholars in precarious job situations that depend on external funding, I am currently facing unemployment. However, in contrast to very many people around the world, I have a roof over my head I can buy my groceries online and I have access to clean water, soap and excellent health care. I am also safe at home, which is not the case for women or children facing domestic abuse. As a result, I can choose to stay at home. This is also obviously not an option if you live in a refugee camp or in an urban slum or if your family depends on your income coming from the amount of vegetables you manage to sell on the roadside during any given day. The ability to social distance is a privilege in itself. I think this is the key when it comes to how ethnography can contribute to raising awareness in the current situation. So this is Karin's uh, contribution. I thank her very much and I hope she gets better very soon and can be with us in the next webinar. So now uh, I pass the word to, well, I think Frederick Keck is not here and neither is our colleague Isaac Niamongo. Frederick Keck is from the Centre National pour la Recherche Scientifique in Paris and uh, uh, Isaac Niamongo. Uh, Isaac. Isaac is from the Cooperative University of Kenya. So uh, uh, Isaac yeah. is on WhatsApp and maybe we can try to put him by WhatsApp. Okay, please. I'll, Isaac, I'll, can you talk? My, my micro. It has to be louder. I, I, I missed the contribution of my other colleagues. But go ahead. It's okay, we can hear you now, Isaac. We can hear you. You can talk, Isaac. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's having some problems with the connection, I see. <laughs> well, let's try after the, the next one, Clara. Okay, all right, so Isaac, Keep trying. If if you can get in, let us know. If you if you are able to, you know, at least to come through via WhatsApp. So the next one is Cristiana Bastos from the University of Lisbon. I give her the word. Okay. Cristiana, you have Italy to activate first. Clara, wasn't Italy before us? Anyway, okay. 
I can't hear you, Clara. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you all for being here. And uh, what I have to say, I have some reflection. Uh, as a discipline, we are somehow uh, a little later than others, but we'll make up for that. Uh, and we'll make a difference among all the noise uh, when, times come, when the time comes to identify the viable links to connect and mediate with the population, be it for communication, be it for all scare delivery, be it for the mitigation of widespread suffering, if we come to a worst case scenario of economic destruction, hunger, and so on, as in the aftermath of major catastrophes. And we have some experience on that in, as anthropologists. Uh, I think that at this moment, there's a kind of numbness of too much information and uh, most sciences are involved in one way or another. Biomedical sciences, of course, pharmaceutical developments, biologists, zoologists. Uh, and there are also economists and uh, engineers and uh, mathematicians working as epidemiologists out of the pocket. And there's a large number of quantitative oriented um, uh, scholars also coming up from sociology, measuring uh, people's attitudes, from social psychology, uh, from everything. Even they are collecting uh, narratives ahead of us, uh, which is something that we're, uh, uh, it's, it's our thing. Now, uh, what's the problem? Is um, I think we, as anthropologists, at least myself, even though I've been in uh, academics for a while, we're still in a kind of a shock because our most dear instrument, which is intimacy, face-to-face, -face, being close to people, having trust, uh, being there in a shared environment, um, is suspended for most, most of us. So we have to make up for that. And uh, we'll make up for that. Uh, we mm, will overcome this. We are already exploring, as uh, our colleague um, uh, from Shanghai already uh, mentioned, uh, there's a lot being done in digital ethnographies. There's a lot uh, uh, being done in, in uh, um, shared uh, self-ethnographies and so on. But um, there's more than that. There's a lot of experience that we accumulated by studying epidemics um, uh, also. We've been around that and we've been around the aftermath of um, calamities. We've been around uh, uh, after earthquakes, after... Uh, uh, volcanoes, uh, hurricanes, and so on. And uh, we, I'm uh, talking now to the worst case scenario of um, major impact of this, of this epidemic. I hope uh, we don't get uh, to that scenario, but uh, just in case, uh, we're ready for that. Uh, we uh, have been there in uh, assisting in um, a more applied anthropology type of way providing direct assistance to population, being mediators, translators, uh, helping in social diagnosis, identifying the fragilities, um, promoting outreach, and so on. But we are also in a more theoretical, reflexive, and analytical level, pulling our tradition into this novel situation. And we, I think we're good on that too. It just takes a, a little bit more time than uh, uh, just jumping to the media with the responses as um, it is happening. So at the level of a more applied anthropology type of thing, our colleagues at the AAA have been doing a, a wonderful work. The Society for Medical Anthropology has already promoted a, a number of webinars, a number of gatherings, resources. You can go to the sites and get a, a plethora of resources on how to act uh, on this epidemic, or you can intervene in diverse populations. How um, you know you go there and uh, and uh, and see it. Um, but one thing is uh, to draw an ideal scenario on, of intervention, and the other thing is to deal with the realities like you're having in some countries where the power, the political power itself, is um, uh, the worst enemy in the facing the epidemic is. Uh, sabotaging uh, what can be done. And we have seen that some of us have been around uh, on the AIDS epidemic, and that was already happening at some point, the political power on the way to addressing the, um, uh, the epidemic. We'll keep working on that, and uh, 
we can work directly with the populations, we can work with the uh, associations, we can work with the uh, uh, middle level or uh, shorter level of uh, political structures. Okay. At a more reflexive level, we can and shall one day engage with the philosophers that they've been putting uh, so much around and so um, grandiose statements that um, I find uh, too premature. I'm not the only one finding them too premature. The state, grandiose statements about uh, biopolitics and the end of capitalism and the general rehearsal for the new era and so on and so on. And um, we can discuss this more later. I'm not uh, particularly interested in going one by one with them. Uh, we are more kind of um, empirical data kind of people, knowing uh, our fields, knowing our uh, uh, issues before we get into these grand generalizations. And uh, we are still in the very beginning of this epidemic to do grand generalization. I don't, I'm not sure that the capitalism is going to end uh, uh, after six months. So I'm, I, I, I'm sure it's not going to happen that way. And I wish we could reduce our carbon emissions in a nice and friendly way and be all happy afterwards. But um, I'm not so sure it's going to happen the way some people are an anticipating. What we do know uh, more is uh, what we learned from previous epidemics. And we have a, a, a set of, I hope Frederick is coming, maybe he's giving an interview to the TV or radio because as a SARS person and as a Sentinel um, um, uh, series uh, person who's like the top specialist on the moment, he can help a lot on uh, the most recent epidemics. Same for those who, are, who study chikungunya, Ebola, and you name it. So we have a whole background, and there's only uh, only a few points, okay, to um, to mention. Meaning, uh, we know that epidemics unfold into multiple meanings, and each subjective or uh, collective experience is an overlapping of different meanings. The biological uh, actual course of the disease, the policies that are on, on top of it, the meaning that uh, it's attributed to that, the stigma that attaches to you, and the violence that uh, comes with that stigma. We already know of cases of health professionals that are being expelled from their living compounds just for being nurses and doctors and therefore being uh, risk groups, okay? Public health, we know that robust public health is needed. We know that. We've been telling that all over, we, uh, when uh, there is, we work with the NGOs, activist groups, charities, whatever, uh, but we don't want it to be too robust to the point of getting into our data for future surveillance. So this is a choice we have to deal with, and as anthropologists, we are in a good situation to discuss this problem. Uh, human on human relationships, we have a lot be, to be said on that, on industrial agrocapitalism, maybe other so we'll talk on this, but I think this is the era of zoonosis in a way that we had never anticipated. But we are already with some experience on that. Also, identifying channels of information delivery and care delivery. We're good at that. We can help on that. And we can do that on a reflexive and also on an applied way. And uh, very importantly, create, helping creating proxies for rituals, for collective rituals, be it... Uh, festivals that people can't live without or can't live without that for too long, being for uh, burials and uh, mourning rituals that generally are about proximity, being together. And with this uh, co current confinement, uh, you, are, um, you, start, uh, uh, you are deprived from that. And that's very impactful on a collective and on an individual manner. Okay, stop. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Cristiana, very much. We will now go to our Italian colleague, um, Roberta Raffaetta from the University of Bolzano. And I apologize because the poster originally did not have her name on. Uh, fortunately, the Italian colleague was able to join in and we will redo the poster so that her name shows up. And also answering the questions that people are posting on the chat. Yes, the questions and the themes to be discussed were sent to the speakers, not to everyone, but we will send them to everyone along with the, you know, we'll put it online together with the video recording, with the sound recording at least of this webinar. 
So please, Roberta, and thank you very much once again. Thanks to you for the invitation and um, uh, hello to everybody. Um, so I'm simply a spokesperson for the many activi activities and research that are going on in Italy. As you know, we are highly affected by the virus. So, um, but it was a great, there was a great, reaction from it. We have numbers of blogs, um, for example, Storia Virali uh, for the Trucani Encyclopedia website, uh, other observatories for, from uh, Milano Bicocca uh, Scholars, Osservatorio La Giusta Distanza, and also an instant book is already out with lots of reflections from anthropology. There's something wrong with your micro. Sometimes you disappear. Uh, okay, do you hear me? Is is the internet connection? Do you hear me? I cannot do yes. anything about that. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Okay, just keep talking. It's fine. So, uh, so this strong tradition of medical anthropology in dialogue with other subdisciplines in Italy. Uh, but to give you some example, um, as, as much as I can know, because there are certainly more others, Giovanni Pizza, Pino Schiripa, and Ivo Quaranta are all working on public and global health uh, discussions of the, co the COVID uh, crisis. And especially Ivo Quaranta is starting already to analyze the social inequalities and emergent needs in Bologna. Yeah. In collaboration with and various in institutions. And uh, also there are analyses uh, already running of ecological rela relations uh, that this applies also to the current crisis. For example, there is a wide partnership coordinated by Bernardino Palumbo on eco-frictions of the Anthropocene. And uh, also we have a, a scholar, Umberto Pellecchia, that has already has done work on epidemics, especially in, uh, in Ebola. So this just to give you a short and of course not of the determinants policies are carrying on. Uh, personally, I work at interface between. Do you hear me? Yeah, you Roberto, hear me? I have uh, perhaps. I, I think it's the pro the problem is your internet connection sometimes fails. So a suggestion would so, be um, turn the video off. If you turn the video okay, off. Okay. Okay. No problem. No problem. Uh, okay. So do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Yes. Okay. Good. So per. Personally, I work at the interface between medical and environmental anthropology, and in the last five years, I've conducted ethnography on how computational biologists create knowledge about the microbial and the viral world, giving shape to a new understanding of health as a property emerging from an ecosystem of connections, within, which include humans and also non-humans. So as this epidemic arrived, I was developing a new research on how this ecosystemic understanding of health translates into public health governance and also in, into its ramifications as personalized medicine, but also in industry and defense. For so yes, when I arrived at a tragic event, but professionally for me was pretty much in the flow as a field for testing and applying my previous insights. Do, do you hear me? Sorry. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I hear you. I hear you. Good. So um, I believe that now as an anthropological community, we have a crucial role in contextualizing mainstream discussions that are going on. For example, the metaphor of war, nationalist talk, ethnic or species shaming, the pseudo fantasies of containment and social distancing, or the shaping of COVID futures through quantification. 
all these mainstream discourses ap appear partial and somehow misplaced when speaking about viruses. Thus, our role can be letting other ideas, terms, and concepts circulate and multiply and make them actionable so that will not be easily forgotten once the pandemic peak will wane. For what concerns my specific research, this means keep the focus on the entanglement of environmental and human health and how this should be part of the reframing of public health, but also of biomedical research. But for many colleagues, this might mean emphasizing public health as a public good that need better funding and careful planning strengthening community and preventive care, also in light of social inequalities, so, so, social inequalities and diversity. And anthropologists, of course, are, are crucial in all these endeavors and settings. This pandemic, as every crisis moment, also brings forth biopolitical challenges that will need to be addressed by anthropologists and will be so important to start now to collect the data and then to expand this into more well thought, face-to-face, -face, uh, embodied ethnographic and comparative research in the anthropological style. But I think that we can also be useful now with more specific and on-spot needs in handling the pandemic. For example, here in Italy, we are witnessing a disconnection between clinical practices and institutional protocols on how to handle suspected cases. And for example, this disconnection could be easily uh, eased by the ethnographic gaze. So to conclude, I think we can have framings on how to intervene on this on this uh, epidemic and also on multiple I think hello yeah Roberto we are having some problems now we cannot it was cutting your discourse it was being cut uh, okay and um, but I I uh, maybe I have more. written so I can paste uh, on the messages if you want sure okay all right what we'll do anyway is um afterwards in the aftermath of this first webinar what we'll do is besides posting the 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 taped um webinar we will try to get everything that people wrote uh, on the chat and both the questions and also uh, the comments and the discussion that has been going on anything that people have written we will also share it to make it easier you know, to connect between the video dash sound uh, recording with everything that has been going on because we are many and there, of course, sometimes there's some technological problems. Okay, okay. thank you. You, you lost all my intervention or you could no, get no, no. some? No, not at all, Roberta, don't worry. We heard everything, I think, Ex just the last seven just seconds. to know. Yeah, so just the end, don't worry. Well, thank so you very just, much. Just my, my end was just to say that uh, we can intervene on multiple time framings and on multiple topics because this epidemic has different. Different speed. Yes, different okay. speed, just like, just like your microphone. It also has different speed. Exactly. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Roberta. And now I, I give the word to our colleague Sergio Cajara uh, from the University of the State of Rio de Janeiro. Sergio, you're on. Sergio, you have to activate your microphone. Perfect. Hello, everyone. Now it's good. So thank, thank Clara, Carmen, 
WCAA for organizing this webinar. Uh, in Brazil, we are living the coronavirus pandemic in a context of a political pandemonium. A journalist said that. A, uh, a mess run by an almost fascist government, as you know. It's not easy to breathe, to calm down, and to think. And this webinar will pre precisely an invitation to do this. In Brazil, other initiatives are trying to, to, to are trying the same, and we can talk about them later if you want. I would like to apologize for po possible noises during my talk. We live now uh, in a world of unexpected and intrusive sounds emerging from the mix of our domestic and professional lives, several lives, <laughs> in fact, from the intense overlap of scientific and lay accounts and narratives, and of political interests and humanitarian exhortations. In fact, an ethnography about noises would be very welcome these days. Thinking of the Brazilian case, what I can surely say is that the pandemic arrived at a time when anthropologists, together with other social scientists, are being considered useless by the Brazilian federal government. Uh, the Minister of Education has declared many times that instead of training social anthropologists, Brazilian education system should have been busy training more helpful professionals, like vets and nurses. With regard to Brazilian government, nothing is expected from us. It is we who need to demonstrate how much we have contributed for public health and how much we can continue to do so. And I would say that at least in the last decades, this contribution has been sound and happened in multiple ways. I have in mind here specifically what happened around the AIDS epidemic. First of all, social anthropology contributed to a critical appraisal of an individualistic cosmology that is still very present in epidemiological and public health thinking. Please, uh, you are hearing me? I have some noises around, but it's impossible to... Yes, we hear you yes, very clearly. So, in, in general, public health professionals do not work with social configurations. They work with populations composed of equivalent individuals, or rather composed by individuals only separable into four large categories, susceptible, infected, survivors, uh, or dead. This com cosmology is present in the way we are currently drawn by large numbers, people, turned into statistics, and, in, and also in the visual representation circulating around coronavirus forms of co contagion. I can um, talk about this later too, if you want. It's not simply a question of denying such a way of, think, such way of thinking, but of problematizing it. In general, social anthropologists have thought to show that real, real people are intersected by many social markers of difference, such as class, race, gender, sexuality, nationality, and etc. And that the social space they move through, through has a topography, with internal borders, naturally confined rooms, and complex communication channels. In Brazil, at the very beginning of AIDS epidemic, for example, anthropological research was crucial to better understand the routes HIV would take in its spread through Brazilian society. Anthropological perspectives have also been central for the critique of the epidemiological concept of risk groups. Here, in this case, uh, the incidence of anthropological reflection introduced a perspective that problematized process of stigmatization and diffusion of moral panics. 
this sure, surely had an impact, an important impact on bioethics, but it had also profound consequences in the way scientific data was produced and disseminated, and in the way public health programs were developed, developed in many countries. Well, this is the main point. I have another uh, uh, other points, uh, and we can uh, talk during the discussion. Thank you. It was thank possible you very to much. Do. Yes, thank you very much, Sergio. That was really insightful. Thank you. And now, last but not least, we have our colleague Charles Briggs from the University of California, Berkeley, whom I thank very much because he had to wake up at quarter to six to join us. So he was an extra expert, which I really appreciate and thank. So please, Charles. Hello, very good to join all of you. During a time of inexcusable but entirely predictable US nationalism, Please pardon me for departing from English with a proverb in Spanish. No hay mal de que bien no venga. There is no misfortune out of which some good cannot come. When I became the president of the Society for Medical Anthropology a mere five months ago, my goals included uh, playing a key role in responding to global climate disruption, the economic precarity of so many of our members, and replacing nationalist and exceptionalist perspectives in US-based uh, anth medical anthropology with horizontally organized, mutually transformative global exchanges. But little did I realize that I would soon have a non-human partner pushing this agenda, um, a particular virus, um, SARS-CoV-2. Thinking across platforms, countries, species, presence and futures is no longer an agenda it is survival, individual and collective. I've been thrust myself too many times into the middle of epidemics. I landed by accident in a cholera epidemic that killed some 500 people in a rainforest of Venezuela in 1992. I was not prepared to make sense of an epidemic, let alone to help stop it. But I figured if anthropology was ever to matter, that was the time. In 2008, Venezuelan physician public health practitioner, medical anthropologist, Vlada Mantini Briggs and I found ourselves again in that same area by accident in the middle of an epidemic that had killed over 38 people in more than a year, but had eluded diagnosis. Along with indigenous leaders who launched their own investigation, we figured out that it was caused by bat transmitted rabies. Does that sound familiar now? So here I confront the questions posed to me. Was I expecting something like COVID-19? Yes. Was I prepared? Hardly. But preparedness is quite a loaded phrase when it comes to pandemics. How might my work in medical and linguistic anthropology help me make sense of an epidemic? I've tried to develop the notion of communicability as a means of understanding the circulation of infectious diseases and how that interacts with what is modeled as the circulation of information about them. With COVID-19, both are off the charts, viruses and discourse about viruses. The cultural models that we muster to organize these complex intersections count on there being a firewall between politics and medicine. In an epidemic, communication should spring from biomedical authority not political expediency or the economic bottom lines of media organizations. The present predic predicament invites US-based anthropologists to decry, with due embarrassment of course, the conflation of politics, medicine, and mediatization that seem to emanate from a particular address on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington DC in the United States. But anthropologists need to stop, I think, before they shore up old oppositions, politics versus medicine, communication versus medicine or public health, that no longer provide useful ways to think about complex human viral technological semiotic assemblages. For medical anthropologists, COVID-19 is like a research focus that jumps off the page and now surrounds us. I direct two graduate programs and the students feel precarious. 
They wonder if they will have futures in the discipline um, and or the money to keep food on their table in the coming weeks and months. The Society for Medical Anthropology is raising funds to provide $500 very small emergency grants to its members who have suddenly lost their incomes and the American Anthropological Association is beginning a broader effort as well. At the same time, I get a couple of requests a day to publish an article or a blog about COVID-19 or to lecture. Clara and I confronted cholera in 1993 and our book on the epidemic came out in 2003. We faced rabies in 2008, but we published books on the epidemic not until 2015 and 2016. It takes time to make sense of such complex phenomena. If anthropologists can figure out how to balance proximal communities and distal ones, such as the amazing um, set of relations that are emerging in this webinar today, and to begin to imagine how we can both provide words that may seem wise today to journalists and to policymakers, but that will provide inspiration um, to anthropological readers when COVID-19 has passed into the domain of history, this will be a new day for global anthropologies. I would invite you also to um, tune in today to look up for the Society for Medical Anthropology's Anthropological Responses to Health Emergencies um, um, webinar, which will be held by the American Anthropological Association today at one o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Thank you, such an honor to be able to, uh, to join in this dialogue with all of you and thanks to Clara for organizing it. Well, thank you very much, Charles. It was a pleasure to listen to you again. I, I want to stress here that the Clara Charles is talking about is his wife, Clara Mantini Briggs, not me. <laughs> Two, two different Claras. Anyway, so thank you very much. It has been really insightful up to now, all the contributions from our colleagues from all over the world. And I'm, I'm going to try once again to reach to our colleague Isaac Niamongo from Kenya, see if he can get through. Carmen, can, can we try again? Isaac? Hello? It would be really interesting to have Isaac's input as he is also a medical anthropology based in Kenya. Carmen, can you hear me? Isaac? Yes, he was hearing you. Now the connections dropped, but I'm calling him again. Okay. Yes, yeah. he's on, he's on. Right. Isaac, can you talk? Hello. Hello. Yes, go ahead. She's hearing you. Everybody's hearing you. Yes, unfortunately, I have missed uh, the, uh, the entire discussion. I'm just going to give a few uh, reflections on, uh, on, on anthropologists uh, because, you know, as, as anthropologists, we can bring onto uh, no, no. the table our expertise on human behavior and also on cultural systems and this should help us to understand better the dynamics of pandemics you know, such as what we are facing uh, uh, today uh, uh, in terms of COVID-19. Uh, first of all um, in Kenya we are at the initial stages where we have few cases Uh, Carmen, I think we lost the sound. Anthropologists, then we can bring in our historical perspectives and mirror, you know, those perspectives into the ongoing pandemic in a way that will help us and that will help the government, that will help 
those who are working in the front line to deal with it. And in bringing in our, our understanding of cultural differences, that should help us to design better responses to crisis and to pandemics. And I'm, I, I'm taking this as an example. We, we talk about social distancing as one of the ways of, you know, uh, controlling uh, the spread of, uh, of COVID-19. But what is social distancing to a rural person, a rural man or woman out there in the countryside? Uh, who would be, what would be much more, you know, relevant to a person in rural Kenya? Is it social distancing? Or would we rather talk about fiscal distancing? Because then that really brings into uh, understanding the, the issue of how it is spread. But also as anthropologists, what happens when experts and politicians uh, argue and disagree on what should be done? Can we then come in as honest habitants uh, to try and, 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 and deal with with the, with the differences that we are seeing, uh, that we see in terms of how you know certain programs should be rolled out, and and therefore as anthropologists, I think we have this unique uh, advantage in that we understand how you know societies operate, we understand cultural systems, we are able to bring in ethnography into our activities, into our work. We have, uh, you know, our our understanding on the use of mixed methodology. I think somebody mentioned that earlier on. We can bring this into uh, into play so that we help in the uh, in, in our response to to the pandemic. And in particular, also we can bring in uh, documentation of lived experiences of communities uh, because you know this is an area in which anthropologists have, uh, have, have an advantage and bringing in issues of holistic approach to issues um, uh, particularly uh, you know in what we are dealing with a holistic approach can help us you know look at things from different angles and it should be able to help us to you know bring in out the different facets of the pandemic so that by understanding all these differences we're able to design programs and activities that you know will be able to bring out a greater impact at the at the community level our, our, our anthropological training uh, should also really help to you know, help us to design programs that are responsive to community needs, programs that are responsive to different social groups. And, and I've just given an example of, you know, some of the programs or some of the decisions that have been made by, by, by government in, in Kenya. We, in Nairobi, in what I might call a lockdown situation. What happens to individuals who live on daily wages? When we ask them not to go out, how do they, you know, at the end of the day, you know, get a meal onto the table? How, you know, what are they supposed to do? When we tell people they cannot move out of their houses, what about those people who live in formal settlements? How do they go to the bathroom, which is outside the house? How do they get water, which is in a tub that is outside the house? So these are some of the things that, you know, as anthropologists, we can bring in so that we are able to advise governments on how to respond to, uh, to this pandemic. We have a national management, a COVID-19 management committee. Unfortunately, this committee does not have social scientists in, in, the, in the committee. And sometimes decisions are made and social scientists are asking, have you taken into account what that implies in terms of 
you know, rolling out certain decisions that have been made. We have a situation where about three days ago, a victim of COVID-19 was buried in the dead of the night. And the whole community has come up, you know, uh, in a, a you and cry, and they're saying this should never happen, that even the dead have should be should be valued and should be respected. When public health experts come out and you know make decisions like those, you know, burying somebody in the middle of the night, not giving family members even an opportunity to see the dead, what's going to happen to cases in the community? Our community is likely to hide those cases so that you know the government does not have access to uh, that information so that they are able to inter their loved ones in a manner that befits them. And, and I think as anthropologists, this is something we can bring on the table and, and help governments to you know implement yeah, certain yeah. decisions in a a decision in, in a manner yeah, yeah, yeah. that is acceptable, in a manner that brings everybody on board to uh, deal with the pandemic. Perhaps I'll stop here for now, and maybe uh, later on I'll make other contributions. Thank you very, very much, Isaac, for your insight. It's very interesting what you just mentioned. We saw that also with Ebola, as you remember, that the problem with the funerals and the communities and the people not feeling they were doing the right thing for their loved ones uh, in the last ceremonies. So. Um, of course, what the, the scenario that Isaac brings us here is the scenario of a continent where things can unfortunately get a lot worse and where the conditions unfortunately are not exactly the same as we have in other parts of the world. So we have now finished this first round of participations and it has been really insightful, I think, and very interesting. Um, what I'll do now is very quickly just go around once again I don't really need you to, to, to speak again, to present things, but just please react to what each other said and please do not take more than three minutes this time so that afterwards we can open to the discussion with our uh, large audience. We have nearly 300 people online. So this is really um, a large outcome. And, um, and so please, I'll go first once again to our colleague from China. Jing Wang from New York University, Shanghai. Are you still there, <laughs> Jing, although it's so late for you? Oh, thank you so much. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I'm still here listening to all the fascinating um, presentations. Um, there are many um, questions I want to ask, actually. Um, although China was uh, the especially Wuhan is a place where the um, epidemic first broke out, but now the global con situation has um, been worsened. In some places have been better, but n apparently not all. So my question actually would be more addressed to everyone um, on the table right here um, is on the one hand, looking at um, the racism surging around the world because at first my colleague and I were particularly interested in looking at how um, this virus is similar to 9-11 in 2001 and afterwards how it impacted the Muslim communities around the world and the perception of Islam. Now there seem to be a rising racism toward the um, Asians, not just Chinese, and the racist attacks toward them. So that was a first reaction we had. But then, um, as we discover more and more from reports and everything, actually, um, it's not just anti-Asian racism, of course, that's real, but the racism seemed to be coming at so many different directions and some of them are quite uh, nationalistic like uh, Charles just mentioned and also within China the xenophobic feeling is growing due to the um, 
fear for the second wave of potential outbreak. So I wonder what do people think of what medical and not just medical, but anthropologists could do to illuminate on this problem, but also maybe doing some public outreach for warning people of this danger of racism and xenophobia and nationalistic sentiments. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jing. Okay, so, um, so what we do now is just passing the word uh, to everyone again. And I think we can go ahead with uh, what our colleague from China just did, which is basically picking up on some issues that were discussed and starting to address comments dash questions. And uh, I invite you all also to start posting your questions on the chat on the right side. Virginia Domingos has already posted one. So that way our participants can start either commenting on issues that were discussed already or already picking up on your questions as we go along. I think one of the issues that came up in the first round of um, participation were the issues of biopolitical challenges. And I think that uh, our colleague from Italy had a very interesting point about the disconnection between clinical and actual um, cases. So, okay, so let's go ahead. Um, after Jing, we have, um, well, we have Roberta. So perhaps Roberta can now uh, go straight to that point that she mentioned before, which was really interesting, that disconnection between the clinical cases and the actual cases. Now my con speaking about connection now my connection should be better. <laughs> Do you hear me? Yes, much better. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, good. Sorry, I live in the mountains and sometimes the connection is poor here. So uh, Claire, you asked me to to qualify better what I meant about this, these connections. Right? Right, right. So um, the institutional protocols to, to tr treat suspect cases tell to doctors, for example, to bring the suspected case all together in a room, uh, but also to treat every person, every patient that maybe do not have COVID symptoms, but have other kinds of symptoms or uh, any other kind of medical urgency, uh, before to be admitted to the hospital, they have to be test tested for COVID. But doctors say that if they test those asymptomatic and potentially not uh, infected people, if they bring in this room together with other people that have symptoms and so potentially they also have contagion those people that maybe have a stroke or whatever other medical condition might also get infected and this just enlarged the the, the rate of contagion you know and uh, do some doctors are aware of these disconnections between who makes the 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 the, the protocols and who stay every day in the reality of the clinics. So they find ways to circumvent these uh, protocols. But you know, it's not something that you can let to the goodwill or the acuity of the singular doctors. It's something that um, having, for example, an ethnographic intervention in looking how, how these institutional protocols are embodied into clinical practices, this, this connection can be easily handled, I think. So this is a, the kind of very short and on-spot intervention that I was mentioning before as an example among many others. Thank, thank you very much, Roberta. I will now pass the word to Cristiana. Can you hear me? All right. Okay. Uh, I was trying to keep up uh, with the reading, um, and I think the most dominant uh, question coming is about inequalities, how uh, epidemic expresses itself. And this is something we've been knowing uh, uh, 
uh, almost since ever, epidemics show the inequalities in society. They show how some people are more vulnerable because they have uh, uh, poorer um, conditions to keep uh, their immunity or whatever other uh, um, concept you use. There are more cofactors in making uh, morbidity higher among certain groups. And that has uh, always at the end of the road uh, correlation with um, uh, economic inequalities. Uh, we know that from all other epidemics, then they show with different configurations uh, for each case. Either it has to do with the transmission or with specific uh, biological reactions. We don't know enough yet about this epidemic, how it's going to... We still don't know about the influenza of 18, 1918, uh, more than 100 years ago. Why did so much uh, younger people die? There were people saying that it was because uh, the older had the immunity to an old uh, former flu. But now we understand that there was more uh, like uh, uh, cytokine storms, uh, more immunological risk. So what we're seeing now is um, differential um, impact in older people. It might turn into something else in a few months or in a few weeks. So we don't know enough yet to generalize that, but we have to keep paying, um, using all the instruments. We can uh, use tools to measure, to assess, to analyze and be prepared to uh, get ready for the, these inequalities to show up. Even though we don't know how they will look like, they know, we know they will, uh, they will show up. There's one very general thing is like the less public health in place you have, the more these inequalities will gonna, it will going to show up. The more uh, you have um, universal vaccinations, uh, uh, care for everybody, uh, whatever, the less you're going to have uh, vulnerable pop populations paying the highest for the bill. So um, if I can come back to this, uh, I would say that we have a good example in place where we are now. Um, there was until recently BCG vaccinations of, um, mandatory and there's, uh, you know, you can be, you can go to the public health system for free and be treated for COVID um, regardless of your income. So uh, if you don't have a public health system in place, you should get one uh, if, um, if, you know, if any good you want to your population. And this is what you sh we should be talking about uh, when uh, talking about biopolitics, not, uh, not some other uh, very grand statements that are going around. It's uh, how the state can uh, assist uh, their citizens by legalizing uh, whoever is not legalized, by taking care of whoever takes uh, looks for all care, by reaching out for people that are um, in a more difficult positions by um, nuancing the stay at home orders as Isaac uh, pointed out by uh, creating differential uh, systems to uh, assist different needs and taking care of the whole population. Right. Thank you, Christiana. So as Christiana just mentioned, most of the comments and questions that are showing up on the chat have to do with these issues of inequalities in the world. And of course, like Christiana just mentioned, it connects to biopolitics, but it connects a lot also with, uh, well, directly political challenges. As I can see on the chat, a lot of our colleagues from Brazil, even Chile, and other countries, uh, besides what Isaac just mentioned, are talking about spaces in the world where such inequalities are so clear and, and just so so uh, abruptly uh, present that it's impossible to have for people to have help. And of course, that has to do a lot with the government. So once again, anthropologists like what Christiana was saying, yes, uh, the governments and the states should indeed, uh, as, as an overall, um, answer, provide better care for everyone, that would be an ideal world, which unfortunately we do not have right now uh, with this pandemia. But anyway, keeping in mind these questions that everyone is asking on the side, I will now pass to, um, to Brazil, to Sergio, especially because so many of our colleagues from Brazil are asking questions about indigenous populations and how 
the number of deaths within these indigenous groups are kept secret almost by the government. Thank you, Sergio. Sergio, your microphone, it's off. Sorry, I was just telling that I, I can't see the, the chat, so I can't see the questions. I don't know if it's a... a uh, you you can see the chat if you click on the, on, the, on the plus thing on the bottom of your screen, and then it will show on the right a long line of, of chats where people have been writing their comments and questions. Yeah, I will try. Bom, uh, I will just react to the, the interventions of the colleagues. I would like to thank, thank them for, for the interventions were very inspiring. And what I heard was different calls. And I would like to think a little more about inequality. No? One of the, the questions raised, I think, Charles brought this very clearly. It's about uh, our community. Huh? What's happening with, uh, with anthropologists, mm -hmm. with students? I think this is very important. Um, it's in, a, in a way, it's, uh, it's, um, it's not to think about we anthropologists and they, the, commu the communities we work with. Huh? What is happening with inside uh, our community? What, what are uh, uh, what the, the kind of support we can give to each other, and and the people uh, and and how to 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 face inequalities inside our communities, not only through different uh, national contexts, but among students and and researchers and profs and etc. So, and I think this is a very important uh, question for the associations, because we, we are, well, I'm thinking now as vice president of the Brazilian Anthropological Association, we have uh, a net, we are in contact with a lot of uh, people, students, uh, professors, and so we need to, to develop some devices to support them, like the ones Charles brought uh, uh, when uh, he, th uh, he talked about uh, the medical, associate, medical anthropology association and the AAA um, in the United States. Another call is how to make public different perspectives uh, on the pandemic. Uh, and I, these different um, perspectives can have impact on the public health programs, for sure, this is very important. How to problematize this we, I'm being very butler in this moment, but when we say we need to wash our hands, we need to wash the hands, our hands, but we don't have, many people in Brazil don't have uh, uh, clean water to do that. When the, 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 their biases in these discourses that have that's class, race, gender implied, so we must to try all the time to bring those perspectives to problematize and pluralize, I don't know if this word exists, the way we are, uh, we are facing the pandemics. And another point, another call that I heard uh, was from Christiana when she said that we must help to reinvent uh, some rituals. I think this is very, very, very important. And the question of the, um, the, the uh, burying and rituals and uh, they're very important, are very crucial in this moment. So this is the, the first reaction about the cause. I thank you for this, this very inspiring um, speech. Hey.
Clara, we are not listening to you. We can't hear you, Clara. Clara, you have to put your mic on. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought I had it on. Okay, Sergio, thank you so much. I just told Sergio that you can click underneath and you can probably find under the mice, you can find the sign for butt pop. Okay, I can see that he's on Frederick, now. Frederick is, is here. Yes, I just saw I just saw that. Frederick, bonjour. Uh, tu m'écoutes? What? Okay. Uh, so, uh, Frederic, uh, bonjour. Uh, on time, so we missed your talks in the meanwhile uh, because you weren't here. But um, I would very much like to welcome you uh, on board. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have had almost 300 people online listening to our webinar, and we've been discussing several issues, basically um concerning the the themes and the questions that i had sent you to to you all so um although we are already quite um into this this webinar if you do not mind of uh talking five minutes to us we've been discussing those questions and uh, especially issues of the role of anthropology trying to uh help solving uh extreme inequalities and um biopolitical challenges as far as this pandemia goes on have been some of the issues that we've been discussing thus far so i was wondering if you'd like to step in and give us some of your insights frederic Kett is our colleague from france from the centre national pour la recherche scientifique cnrs and uh, thank you very much for being here and i give you the word frederic Frederick, you have yes. to activate the sound. Yes. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, sorry, I haven't been able to join before. There was some problem with the connection to the Zoom meeting. Um, so uh, my intervention on the COVID-19 pandemic uh, comes from the work I have done um, in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore on what I have called the uh, Sentinels of Pandemic. Uh, and it is a, a work that I've done in discussion with uh, colleagues in the U.S. on uh, technologies of preparedness, uh, which uh, can be distinguished from techniques of prevention by the fact that uh, prevention calculates a risk on a territory. Uh, so it's very much connected to epidemiology, uh, whereas preparedness um, uh, uh, mitigates uh, disasters uh, through technologies of imagination, such as uh, sentinel devices, uh, which uh, perceive early warning signals of pandemic uh, at the animal level or uh, at the level of um, physicians in contact with uh, vulnerable uh, populations, uh, but also um, uh, simulations of um, uh, uh, pandemics in hospitals where uh, physicians, uh, hospital staff uh, learn to um, do uh, gestures and take decisions uh, on, a, on a regular basis for extraordinary situations as we see now uh, in Europe with um, uh, the question of triage uh, and then um, stockpiling of uh, masks, uh, 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 antivirals, vaccines and in my book, I contrast stockpiling, uh, which is a, a, a measure for emergency situations as today, which uh, raises a lot of controversies, with the ordinary practice of uh, storage. And uh, storage is what virologists do when they uh, uh, build uh, data banks of uh, viral sequences, or even more, uh, more, 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 more um, uh, uh, simply when they fridge uh, viral um, samples uh, uh, to do what I call a cryopolitics, which is a kind of conservation of the past to anticipate the future. Um, so the argument I have tried to make, uh, especially in the, in the Francophone media uh, uh, that have been uh, uh, very curious about my work, because we know very little about the SARS crisis in France and uh, I've worked a lot with uh, experts who have, have built uh, systems 
of public health and, and, and detection uh, and biosecurity after SARS in, in Hong Kong and Taiwan and Singapore. What I've tried to argue is that um, as Sentinel territories are more prepared to uh, pandemics than, um, um, uh, than, than national states uh, uh, which rely on precautionary measures such as confinement. Uh, I argue that precaution is a mix uh, uh, of pre prevention, which is what we have done for two centuries in Europe uh, uh, based on technologies of the welfare state as statistics, social security, mutualization of risk, and preparedness, which is something quite new that has emerged in the US in the, in the 1990s uh, with um, uh, anticipation of, uh, of bioterrorist attack uh, from, uh, from former Soviet uh, states. Uh, or from uh, Middle Eastern countries, uh, and then uh, from uh, uh, South China as an influenza of, of, uh, of uh, as an epicenter of influenza. So my argument is that um, uh, uh, one of the causes for the lack of preparedness in Europe is that we are still very uh, focused on on precaution, uh, which is this 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 kind of intermediary rationality between prevention and preparedness. Whereas um, uh, uh, Asian states such as um, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and now South Korea, because the reaction of South Korea has been very impressive, um, and in some way Japan also, uh, uh, are more um, uh, uh, easily uh, practicing preparedness. And I, I try not to be deterministic, but I think that the, uh, we need to have a kind of culturalist view or ontological view, uh, which is that precaution, uh, makes a strong distinction between nature and, and culture. Uh, and so we, in Europe, we've, we've implemented precaution by killing uh, millions of, of cows and, and birds when there was a, a, a mouth cow disease or, or, or bird flu, which are zoonosis. And now that there is this new zoonosis from VATS coming from China, we still use precautionary measures such as confinement because basically that's what the sovereign state knows uh, you should do, which is have strong measures to, to, to reply to the demand for security. Whereas preparedness is something that is um, implemented by experts involving uh, not only the state but, or the government, but also, but also the, the civil society. And we see in Hong Kong or Taiwan that people are very uh, 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 eager to uh, wear masks or use uh, technologies of tracking, even if it raises question for uh, uh, civil liberty. Uh, and so, so I, I make the argument that preparedness is more adequate to Asian societies precisely because they don't have this, um, this long history of what, what Philippe Descola calls naturalism, which has separated humans from animals, and that they have understood better this, this idea that the ecology of infectious diseases has, has raised in the 1960s that nature strikes back so if you want to understand uh, the early warning signals of, um, uh, 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 of bats or birds through sentinel devices, then you need to communicate with animals and, and be more, more humble uh, in managing security threats. Uh, and, and so that's how I explain. I don't mean, I don't mean that um, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, or Singapore are more close to hunting societies because it would be very paradoxical for such um, high-tech societies. What I mean is that uh, in, in China, more Shut up, you fucking nigga. <laughs> Very strange thing on the screen. Hello? Niggas in my butt. <laughs> okay. So what I mean, and I will end by that, is that um, whereas in, in Europe, and I don't know for the US and for Brazil, but whereas in Europe we have this strong naturalist tradition which uh, uh, forces the state to use precautionary measures, in Asia there is this mix of of, um, ah. of sentinels or synergetic techniques uh, and analogism um, and uh, I uh, they, they, they I think this mix is interesting in Asia and and in Europe we have this mix of uh, naturalism and analogism which is this precautionary measures and 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 all the question raises on on sacrifice how many lives we can sacrifice I think it's a it's a major question for today so I end up there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Frederic. Can you please now put your mic on mute?
Yes. Uh, can we? Yes. We had some interference there. I don't know what it was. Uh, to finalize, I wanted to pass the word to Charles. It actually showed up on Charles' screen, this strange uh, toys. I hope it was nothing in your computer. Charles? Um, welcome to the world of Zoom bombing. Right. This is a real problem. You really have to watch the chats. Often people will put up a link there. If you click on them, um, you will lose control over your computer. These are, you know, unfortunately, the worst of times bring out the worst of people, and we just met one of them. But not so on my computer. Please, everybody, don't click on any links. Don't put any links on the chat, please. Um, but um, it's, um, it's quite, uh, maybe I could build, first of all, um, for a moment on what Sergio was saying. So in the middle of the cholera epidemic, um, in the eight months that they had in Venezuela to try to prepare the country to be able to prevent an epidemic, there were in a wonderful collaboration in the media, they had all of these uh, public service announcements where you saw a middle-class housewife in a beautiful kitchen um, showing how to be able to boil water, wash fruits and vegetables, wash your hands, and then store in the freezer water that was had been boiled for later use. Um, the one problem was that this was sent out at on the um, the message to the country as a whole was that indigenous people, the poor, sixty percent of the population, and street vendors were going to be the human vectors for the disease, not the middle class. So the middle class said, "Oh, we could we could do all of these prevention strategies, but we don't have to because we're not going to get cholera." And the other 60% of the population said, well, we can't do these because we don't even have running water in our homes. We don't have bathrooms in our homes. We don't have money for fruits or vegetables or soap. And therefore, the massive um, campaign was largely a failure. Where can anthropology enter in here? These are very complex issues which are unfolding rapidly. So many of us have talked for so many years about global anthropologies. It's wonderful that Virginia Dominguez, who's been a major promote, promote, proponent, is, is on, the, uh, um, on this particular meeting. And is Danilin Rutherford, who's the president of the, of the, anthrop of the Winter Grand um, anthrop Foundation for Anthropological Research, which has been another major force pushing for a, a broader sort of post-national set of anthropologies. Right now, we have no choice, and the stakes are very high. So I wonder, how is it that we might be able to mobilize the sort of conversation that has taken place today across so much of the world um, into a real transformative moment for anthropology? And this is a precarious moment. So many of our graduate students are on the point of losing all of their income, potentially. New PhDs are looking forward to a hiring freeze rather than a hooding ceremony this spring. Um, so how is it that we can think about supporting anthropologists at the same time that we try to mobilize anthropology as a means of being able to address the tremendous complexities and concerns of the pandemic? I also, uh, a couple of remarks I thought were very good about how anthropology is not a wonderful vehicle for jump, jumping into global sweeping statements, right? which tend to essentially um, to reproduce the common sense notions that actually drive the infrastructures that lead us into these sorts of situations and as well as provide forms of rationalization in advance. Anthropologists are often good at trying to pull apart the way in which those infrastructures are constructed. And that often involves very careful situated forms of research Right, Frederick could not have sort of thought about SARS in a global pandemic without doing that sort of careful research in a number of countries. So how might be this a moment in which we could potentially build new research and training collaborations across countries, across universities, to link together in a way that would not only enable us to deal with the complexity, the global distribution, the variability of how COVID-19 and the mitigation measures that are taken in response to it uh, unfold in localities, in cities, in countries across the world. How might we turn this as a beginning for a kind of new anthropology, which would hopefully be sustained in the future and provide interesting research possibilities, training possibilities, that will also help us to be able to confront both the threat to anthropology as well as the threat 
to the health of anthropologists and the many communities in which they live and work. It's been a great honor to be part of the conversation. And again, thanks to you, Flata, for organizing it and to all of the uh, other participants in the, in the webinar. Thank you very much once again, Charles. I don't know if our colleague Isaac wants to go in again since he had a second turn. Carmen, do you know if he's still there? Clara? Yes, he's, he's there. <laughs> I just want to raise uh, uh, three, uh, three things. Uh, first one was kind of like alluded to by our colleague from Shanghai. And this has to do with uh, how we deal with asymptomatic cases. Because uh, in, in a situation where the pandemic spreads out into the rural areas, uh, and I'm taking the case of Kenya as an example. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm a little bit less worried about people who are symptomatic. I am more worried about the asymptomatic cases because then those are the ones that you know keep spreading the virus, and and, and you know, and, and and we are not able to uh, to pick them out in uh, in uh, in the community. So, is there anything that anthropology can do in order to be able to, uh, you know, uh, perhaps, you know, address the issue of, uh, you know, people who are not necessarily, you know, showing symptoms, but who are nonetheless in, you know, in the community and they are spreading the uh, the virus. So maybe this is something we need. We need them to ask ourselves as anthropologists: What is it that we can do in a situation like, like this? Now, one of the other things we have not been able to, uh, perhaps, uh, maybe I missed it, but we have not been able to talk about, are the unintended consequences of the lockdowns. For example, we have in Kenya seen an increase in gender-based violence as a result of the lockdown. We have seen sexual violence within within households. So how do we address this? How do we anticipate that you no know, certain actions may lead to other unintended consequences? We are taking one action in order to limit and reduce the spread of the virus, but that same action onto something else that uh, you know uh, we uh, perhaps have not anticipated. And and then lastly of uh, uh, vulnerable groups who require support. When we make decisions to lock down cities, lock down communities, to curtail movement, what happens to the elderly who require support, who require, you know, perhaps, do we have social safety nets that will able to address the challenges that, you know, the vulnerable groups, the elderly, the children, uh, may be able to deal with the orphans, for example, may be able to, to, to deal with. Do we have, you know, interventions in place to be able to support uh, those uh, those groups? Is this something that as, an, as, as anthropologists we need to, to be thinking about so that we may be able to address some of these inequalities in society? Thank you. All right, Isaac, thank you very much. This was Isaac uh, from the Cooperative University of Kenya, our colleague from uh, WCA. Now we have several other questions on the right side on the chat. Uh, then Lynn, post the link, please do not open it. We're not supposed to post links due to the hacking problems that uh, have been um, mentioned here before. Um, uh, Roberta, had asked me to just um, give her the word just for a few minutes again, so I will do that. I think that, well, what's been happening now is we're already 10 minutes over the time. We said this would last for one and a half hour. Uh, we're already 10 minutes late, but I think we can give it 10 more, 15 more minutes because people are uh, interested and uh, everybody's participating. I think that the two issues that have been mentioned here, one of them mentioned by Virginia Dominguez and other people, the question of the flexibility that uh, anthropology uh, has to have and how do we as anthropologists uh, think of um, 
anthropological research? How can we do this research now? That question, and now the question that Isaac just went into, which is the, the problem of systematic violence, especially domestic violence, but not only. Those are two very interesting uh, questions, but the problem is we cannot address all the millions of questions that come, come up on the major issue of, of the pandemic of the pandemia. So I, I suggest we, you know, we discuss a few more of the questions that show on the chat and then perhaps we can organize a second webinar on more specific issues um, subsequent to this uh, situation uh, in a very near future within the next few weeks. So please, uh, Roberta, I give you the word. Yeah, thank you very much because I just wanted to to finish to comment on what you asked me because you asked me a very specific questions about the disconnections and so on. But actually, the uh, the point that I wanted to do in relations to the questions that are appearing on the side is that, of course, an, a pandemic confront us with very human concerns such as public health, social inequalities, racism, marginalization, geopolitics, uh, uh, and so on. And this is, is all legitimate and, and important. But I think that a pandemic as this one is really pointing also to another thing, is also pointing to the fact that we also have, as Frederick was pointing out, we have also to think differently what is biopolitics that is not just restrained to humans but includes also non-humans and environment. So this is the point that I wanted to write and to contribute uh, to, to the questions and to open up uh, other questions from the public. Thank you. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Roberta, thank you very much. This was our colleague Roberta Raffaetta from the University of Bolzano. And um, I just, so a very interesting question here. Uh, actually, it's more a, a comment and a, a suggestion for um, for reflection on, you know, I, I think, uh, no, I've lost it. It was here on the chat, um, but there's so many comments and questions. But basically, it was the idea of what do we as anthropologists, what what can we do about about the field work. Uh, Virginia is asking here again, what about field work? What we do if we cannot do field work now? What is, what is going to come? What is ahead of us? Do you th can en do, does anyone want to address this uh, issue? Um, I think Go, go ahead. Yeah. Jing, Jing was, was starting to talk, please. Jing Wang. Oh, I, I thought I saw Charles was starting to talk. No? I'll follow you. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Thanks. No, I, I was just um, thinking about this recently as well, because although we, uh, so currently I'm a postdoc at NYU Shanghai, although we do have discretionary funds, but actually I've been socially distancing or semi-quarantined um, in my home for the past four months almost, um, unable to do any physical field work. I believe there are many other people who felt the same. And also so many universities um, already sent out emails warning their students, especially PhD students, not to do field work, even if they have summer travel funding and things like that. So I see some of my friends who are um, really inventive in doing stuff like, um, of course, using digital um, tools like Zoom or because of the security reason they opt for other ways such as uh, Skype or in China, like WeChat and things like that, and also use VPN to cross the firewall so that they can talk to more activists who are uh, being suspected by the state. So the stakes are high, but I see that uh, people are trying to move more online and to do things there. Um, 
that is something I want to mention, but also I'm curious, like, how do people also respond to this anxiety of not being able to do field work for maybe half a year or even a year? Um, is it okay not to be productive because of this time? And how we can really support each other while being socially distanced and not be so anxious in that sense. Right, Jing, thank you very much. I will now pass the word to Charles and then try to wrap up because we're already um, almost half an hour beyond our time limit. Go ahead, Charles. Well, I think probably the experts on this are our students, especially graduate students today, many of whom saw the collapse um, from almost one week to the next of what they'd imagined for their own doctoral projects and have been actively thinking about how it is that they could can reconfigure analytically precise and important types of research on an entirely virtual basis. One difficulty is that many of us are not actually experts on um, really thinking about the virtual world. So therefore faculty members, we've had to really retool almost immediately, not just I learned how to use Zoom at four o'clock on Monday, and I gave a course to 100, to 100 students, over 100 students, the next morning at 11. I spend about five hours a day on Zoom learning how to be able to teach. All of us are having to reinvent the world, as well as forms of sociality, to where we're often finding people with whom we haven't connected for a while and having a drink with them virtually. But one thing that's amazing is there's a tremendous amount of information out there right now. First of all, anthropologists have been exploring the virtual world for a long time. And anthropologists, some of them, um, I'll give a little shout out it, um, to Hector Beltran, who teaches in anthropology at MIT, whose undergraduate degree is in computer science. So they're anthropologists who understand the infrastructures and are looking at how it is that those are made, as well as how they unfold with regard to hacker and other forms of sociality. So there's a lot of anthropological work there on which we can draw. It's not a time to reinvent the world along those lines. There's a tremendous amount of research, uh, of a number of resources that are out there about virtual research. Um, to how to be able to, um, to engage in virtual research. And we need to learn about this very quickly. There'll be some very exciting projects that are emerging. I have a student in India whose project became doctoral research. He chose to stay in India. It became virtual, virtually overnight. And I think it's now mo more robust and interesting than it was a month ago. But that won't happen for everyone. So I think that the idea that for so many of our students to say, sorry, game over, no more research is probably not the right message, but let's think collectively, creatively, especially using some of the anthropologists who've been doing virtual research for now over a decade to help us think about how to do deep, robust types of anthropological research where theoretical analytic questions are at the center, as well as some of the specificities of fieldwork themselves are attended to. Many of those might have to be collaborative Right, to be able to think about, because after all, you need to be able to often have those contacts. It's hard often to find the context to initiate the research interviews, forms of participant observation, as opposed to sort of being there in the field. So what will all of this mean? Again, our students, our graduate students in particular, are right out there on the forefront now. They are pushing ahead. And I think it's extremely important that we say, we believe in your futures. We understand that your presence right now are catastrophically wrapped around a virus, which is affecting so many lives. On the other hand, it's important to say, we will make sure that we ensure that we help to support you and anthropology as a whole in building more robust, even if different and unpredictable futures. Well, thank you very, very much, Charles. I really empathize with all you were saying, inclusive the, my technological inability. So I understand perfectly well what you went through, but anyway. So I wanted to, of course, we could linger on, we could stay here for hours and hours. We can't, we've been here for almost two hours now. Uh, so I think it's enough. We will surely organize following up 
webinars and there has been several important and specific topics that have been raised here that I think we can take up and, and discuss in, in following webinars. I want to just read a, a comment dash question that one of our colleagues, Patricia Scal, I cannot read the rest of the last name. She says, many questions we ask in anthropology do not reflect a problem to most of those who are not involved in the discipline. There is a paradox between drawing our expertise from everyday life, but being unable to respond to everyday life problems as the ones we are facing now. And she says she would like to hear more about this. And of course, I think this comment that our colleague wrote on the chat kind of summarizes some of the issues we've been discussing here. And of course, that we've not discussed full way. We have not finished the discussion, but I think it leaves us the option and the appetite to do this more times and uh, virtually communicate with uh, amongst ourselves and to the outside world beyond anthropology, which I think is really needed. So, like I said, uh, the recording of this webinar will be posted probably within, I think, the next two days. It's not normally readily available. Uh, the system needs to process it, but, but will be online in the WCAA website. And I once again want to thank the University of Northern British Columbia and our colleague Michelle Bouchard, the secretary of WCAA, who uh, made this possible by being the host. And of course, I want to thank all the participants. Uh, so uh, from China, our colleague Jing Wang, uh, from Norway, Karine, who unfortunately, since she's sick, could not be here, but she was with us. I read her statements. Uh, from France, Frédéric Keck from Kenya, Isaac Niamongo, from the University of Lisbon, Cristiana Bastos, from Brazil, Sergio Cajara, from the US University of California, Berkeley, Charles Briggs, and from Italy, our colleague Roberta Raffaetta from the University of Bolzano. I also want to thank very much to the chair of WCA, Carmen Rial, uh, who helped in putting up the poster, and uh, my colleagues who work with me at the Portuguese Anthropological Association, who also helped organizing this and gathering all the information, bio notes, et cetera. And this will all be available, will be available to all of you um, in, in the next uh, day or so. So thank you very, very much. Uh, please stay well, uh, keep your social distances, but let's keep in contact. And uh, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Clara. Bye-bye.